Liz Le Servigé, a French-inspired artist of Montpelier, decided to donate to the State House Collection this magnificent painting called Love Note to Montpelier, um, portraying the State House bulging with people, some of them actually falling out of the windows, the Valentine bandit having attacked the building with his signature phantom hearts on the front door, a dinosaur made of recycling materials in the lower in the lower part and all species day um, celebrated on the state house lawn lots going on and it's a love note to her new community of montpelier we're delighted to have it as part of the state house collection hello this is uh topper mcfawn uh representing barry town uh, I want to talk to you the, this morning about a contraception bill. It's H663, and the main purpose of the bill is to uh, reduce uh, the incidence of abortion. Um, there will be a education program that will be uh, carried out in the schools um, in, in terms of the reality of, of uh, a pregnancy. And um, there'll also uh, be a public uh, information, a robust public information program about this. Uh, the basic deal is this. All of the contraceptive methods um, will be free. And in the schools, uh, over-the-counter uh, contraceptives, contraceptives will be given out free. Um, we're also trying to add a piece to the bill where pharmacists will be able to prescribe uh, after some training and, uh, and so on uh, and approval by the Board of Pharmacy. Uh, they'll be able to uh, give the, some of these contraceptives out free over, the, over their counter. Um, uh, basically, um, we see this bill as a way to prevent uh, unintended con uh, uh, pregnancies, and um, we hope that it will be successful. Thank you. Hello, I'm Representative Ann Donahue from uh, Northfield in Berlin, and on the House Health Care Committee. Um, really excited about something that's actually happening in another committee right now, but a, a, a resolution that I actually brought forward 10 years ago didn't have momentum then. This year was co-sponsored by several folks along with myself. And it looks back to a pretty dark time in Vermont history and that was the eugenics movement when we sort of took all the folks that we were scared of or didn't like or were different from us and decided that they were the cause of negative things happening in our state and we should sterilize them. Um, and uh, hopefully we've learned better, but the reality is we still um, mistreat and misapply laws to people that we think are different um, or don't like. Um, so it's a really important thing to recognize um, what we did in the past and learn from it. Uh, so this resolution is really an apology, an acknowledgement and an apology for what we did at the time. It's, it's pretty scary if you read some of the documents. The governor of our state, editorials in the free press saying, you know what, our institutions are filling up with these folks and we can't afford to do that. We can't allow them to continue to propagate. Some of these were folks just because they were very poor and therefore didn't have access to education. Um, the Abnaki population was particularly affected, um, but anyone really with a label, uh, either developmental disability or um, a psychiatric disability, um, so it was a, a pretty scary time for folks. Um, I'm really glad that we're looking back and acknowledging it and at least making a statement about it and hopefully reminding all of ourselves um, to, to not put that kind of labels on people and treat them differently as a result. Hi, I'm Kurt McCormick, representative from the city of Burlington. I represent uh, the old North End and downtown Burlington. 
and here in the legislature I chair the Transportation Committee and I will talk about that a bit today. Um, uh, the most important thing I think we can do uh, in, in our committee uh, this year and in the next few years, but especially this year, is to deal with climate. Um, uh, the transportation sector uh, contributes more to uh, climate change than any other sector of the economy uh, in Vermont. It's actually true in most states, but it's especially true here, actually. We drive more than the national average per person, and we also have done a lot of good work on cleaning up our electric power uh, grid, the power plants that we have here and the power that we buy. Uh, the lion's share of that is now um, uh, renewable and uh, not uh, carbon producing, so that leaves transportation as uh, by far the largest uh, sector, 45 percent all by itself. And we have a number of things that we're uh, trying to do and I will be frank and say they're, they're all difficult because some people, including some members of the committee, don't seem to think we need to do anything. They just seem to think we need to just continue talking about climate and transportation and watching public television programs about it and, um, and not actually do anything. So, except, or at least not, not do much. Uh, and we need to do a lot. So we're working on um, uh, demand, uh, transportation demand management. That's where employers, large employers, would have um, uh, incentives and other uh, means of um, enticing their employees to carpool to work and not to be driving by themselves, to take transit where that's practical, where, where, depending on where this, the plant is and where they live, um, and uh, van pools and, and just anything you can do. But I think the main thing is going to be carpooling, and um, uh, some uh, employers go as far, such as UVM, University of Vermont, has a program where nobody parks for free anymore because you know parking actually is not free. It might be free um, out in uh, uh, off side of the road someplace, but in in a in a, uh, in a hospital, at a school, uh, at a place like UVM, um, it's far from free. Um, that land could have other things on it. The, the parking lot, the parking lot has to be paved, has to be repaved periodically. It has to be lit. It has to be uh, plowed of snow. Um, we need to stop building parking and build carpooling uh, and, and transit. Uh, by transit, as you know, we, we mean um, uh, mainly buses in Vermont, but, but also rail. Uh, we want to um, uh, have uh, more on uh, EV incentives, electric car incentives, to try to incentivize those to buy them. Uh, not those that, that don't need the incentive, but those that do. Try to turn that around, uh, put in a lot more ch uh, charging stations. The governor's um, plan is a, a good one, <coughs> where we would have a uh, charging station, a level three charging station. Those are the ones that charge uh, very quickly. We would have one of those within 30 miles of every home in Vermont. Uh, it's a great goal, and, and we're uh, working towards that. Uh, so there's a lot of other things we're doing, but um, uh, again, my main challenge is to get people interested and understanding that we actually have to do some things differently. Hi, I'm Representative Mike Intochka from Charlotte, Vermont, and I'm a member of the House Energy and Technology Committee. And we have uh, passed out the Global Warming Solutions Act, which is uh, an act that will put into state requirements the goals we've had for reducing our greenhouse gas emissions uh, in line with the Paris Climate Accord, which the state has signed on for as a member of the Climate um, Alliance. And um, the goals would be to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, which, by the way, have increased by 30, 13 percent over 1990 levels uh, by today, and uh, it's going. The 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 uh, requirement is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 25 percent below 20, 2005 levels by 2025, and then 40 percent below 1990 levels by 
by uh, 2030, and then 80% uh, below 1990 levels by 2050. Um, the climate crisis, uh, the climate change crisis is real. It's affecting us now. It's costing us $15 million a year in uh, infrastructure damage from extreme weather events right now. It's changing our climate so that we have shorter uh, winters and longer growing seasons and uh, more precipitation. So we have to do something about it. The bill creates a climate council, climate action council, that will be composed of members of the administration as well as uh, some members appointed by the House and some appointed by the Senate. And this climate action council will be tasked with uh, creating a plan that will help us uh, that will help us reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. It also requires the Agency of Natural Resources to um, develop rules, regulations that will help us achieve the uh, the uh, plan recommendations and um, these rules will be looked at by the legislature and if there is any uh, additional legislation that's required to uh, authorize agency of natural resources or the agency of transportation or any other agency of government uh, to do their job uh, we would have a say over that and any appropriations or uh, revenues generation that uh, would be required by the uh, plan would also have to be approved by the legislature so there is legislative oversight. If ANR fails to enact rules uh, by a certain time, uh, there is uh, a cause of action. Uh, a citizen can sue to require the agency to do its job and, and do those. There, there are no damages assessed, so there's uh, so it's basically uh, it's basically a uh, an avenue for citizens to weigh in if uh, the agency is not doing its job. And likewise, if we reach 2025 and those greenhouse gas emission goals are not met, if the reductions aren't met, um, then a citizen can bring a cause of action and require the agency to revisit the rules and uh, come up with the recommendations to achieve those, those uh, uh, emission reductions. So uh, we hope to get this bill passed. Uh, tomorrow on second reading and uh, by the way this is Wednesday so tomorrow is Thursday and uh, then it'll go on for third reading on Friday and uh, hopefully on to the Senate. Hello I am State Representative Cynthia Browning from Arlington I also represent Manchester Sandgate and part of Sunderland here in the state legislature. What I'm going to talk about today is the upcoming veto override vote on the minimum wage legislation. The governor has vetoed this bill, so it's gone to the Senate. The Senate has overridden his veto. Now it's going to come to the House to see if the House will do the same. I voted against this minimum wage legislation originally, and I expect to vote to sustain his veto. And there are a number of reasons for that. First of all, it's important that people understand that Vermont had actually began raising the minimum wage back in 2014. It was $8.73 then, and it is now $10.96. So we had like three jumps, and after those three jumps, we are continuing to raise it with inflation. So the minimum wage will continue to rise with inflation. So it's really important. I know that people think, oh, you know, they haven't had a raise. Actually, they have. I voted for that because it had been a long time. But I'm very concerned about additional large increases because we would be going to 1255 from 873 that's like um, a 50 percent increase I'm not adjusting for inflation or anything but that's a big increase and I'm worried that it will affect the number of jobs created the number of times businesses substitute machines for people um, I'm just worried about our small businesses being able to absorb that magnitude of an increase but even more than that is the problem that this increase won't necessarily really help the people that we're most concerned about. Many people are concerned about, say, a single mother with two children who's working minimum wage jobs. 
she will also be getting state benefits to help her. If her minimum wage income goes up, she will have to pay taxes on it and she will lose benefits and she may not even be better off. And if the cost of labor goes up, sometimes what, what businesses do is they have to cut back on hours because they can't always just raise their prices to recoup more revenue. Remember, they're competing with Amazon, they're competing with New Hampshire, with you know entities with whole different cost structures. So I just think it's too much too soon, too fast. If we really want to help low-income workers, it would be better to increase what's called the earned income tax credit. This is a way in which Vermonters who earn all of their income working for wages can get a refundable tax cre credit that really reliably increases their after-tax income. I don't believe that this minimum wage increase is the right thing to do now. Another factor is that sooner or later we will have a recession. We haven't had a recession in a long time and that means it's due. It may be over do. And the last thing you want to be doing is raising wages going into a recession because you'll just end up with more people losing their jobs. And that's what this bill does because there's no way to stop it. There's no recession trigger. There's no way to say, wait a minute, this is not a good time to raise wages because more people will lose their jobs. We're going to stop. There's nothing about that in there. There's no regional variation. We know that that um, wages are going to be higher in the Chittenden County area than they are in, um, in Caledonia or Essex or Orange or Bennington County. And yet all of the state will have the same increase in wages. I think that's going to be very hard on businesses in our rural areas. And if it's hard on businesses, it's hard on workers, and it's hard on communities. So I will be voting to sustain the governor's veto. It isn't that minimum wage workers don't need help. They do. We have given it to, it to them. We are continuing to give it to them. But the earned income tax credit would be a better, more reliable thing to do than this minimum wage increase. Thank you. My name is Brian Smith. I'm a state rep from uh, Orleans 1, which covers, carry the towns of Derby, Morgan, Charleston, Holland, and Brownington. Uh, my house bill is uh, 847. It's pretty much being called the flag bill around here. And it's in the education committee right now. I sponsored it myself for the sole purpose so I wouldn't have to put anybody else's names on it. Uh, I figured it would cause some controversy and I'm I wished it hadn't, but uh, the, the purpose of this bill is to slow down school board process so that these school boards can, uh, can discuss further educational funding. Uh, tax dollars are going uh, into a lot of wasted time in school board meetings, and this bill is not designed to take away from anyone, any group or any ethnic group or any particular group. Uh, what it's designed to do is K through 12 is supposed to carry the Vermont flag and the United States flag on its properties. Uh, the taxpayers from both sides of the very liberal aisle, the very democratic aisle, and the very republican aisle, a conservative aisle. And the whole purpose of this bill is to let these school boards concentrate more on education funding and spend the tax dollars that everybody is spending way too much of uh, more on education of the kids than anything else. Uh, that's the whole purpose of the bill. I wish more people understood it. Uh, I hope to have the opportunity to explain it to the Education Committee once I hear back from Chairman Webb, Chairperson Webb, excuse me. Thank you. Hi, I am Representative Sharon Fagard. I represent the towns of Highgate, Franklin, my hometown of Berkshire, and Richford. I sit on the House Ag and Forestry Committee. And this session, we have been working on a few different issues. Um, we've been working on the Livestock Adequate Shelter Bill, which is supposed to help clarify um, some of the um, kind of minimum requirements uh, to help avoid confusion both with people who don't know anything about livestock um, unnecessarily filing reports that have no grounds as well as to provide a better legal standing when there is abuse or neglect that does need to be dealt with by our, our judicial system. And I think we've made some pretty good progress on that bill and we've heard from people from a lot of different organizations from the livestock um, something advisory council, I can't remember their full name yet. Um, but also, we have already passed out of committee a bill that I thought would be contentious, but in fact has been 
really surprisingly easy. And what this bill is going to do, unless it's radically changed by the Senate, um, is it will change current use law so that instead of having to remove two acres for every single dwelling on your land that is in current use, as long as those dwellings are within a two acre box, um, rectangle or square, um, you won't have to take additional acreage out of current use. It will in no way undermine your local uh, zoning laws or anything like that, but it will allow maybe, um, you know, like a, a small home for your kid who wants to stay and work on the farm or maybe a little vacation cottage so that you can Airbnb that. Um, different things like that will make it a little more viable for, um, for farms to, to make additional income or have additional help without losing land to current use. Um, we will be continuing to work on another bill that would allow solar arrays of up to one-tenth of an acre with the same provision that you won't have to remove that land from current use. Um, and then we're also working on an agritourism limited liability <laughs> bill that will, just like ski mountains and kind of equine um, businesses, provide a little bit of structure and uh, descriptions for exactly what kind of signage is required so that as long as somebody is being a responsible farmer, it will provide a little bit of security for agritourism, which is another way that our agricultural industry can bring in a little extra money and hopefully help inform the public better about where their food comes from. So thank you. Thank you.